I like fast. Okay, so that was good morning. We're running a little late, but that's okay. Anyone, anyone wish we would cut the content back to speed it up? All right, then we'll go ahead with the content that we have. Um, so our next speaker, this is going to be very good, Joshua Bixby from Strange Loop Networks. They've, I don't know if you, uh, he's got a great blog. I don't know if you follow the, uh, his blog and the work that Strange Loop is doing. But the thing, I really like the work that they're doing. And the thing that they do really well, hey, Karina, is um, talking about the business uh, effects of performance. And so he's going to talk, and for me, this year has been all about mobile. That's been my focus. And so I'm very excited to have Joshua here. He's going to talk about business KPIs and mobile. Please help me welcome Joshua Bixby from Strange Loop. Thanks, Steve. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Berlin holds a special place for me. Uh, my grandmother's here, uh, lived, was born here and raised here, so it's wonderful to come realize why she's so crazy uh, and wonderful and artistic and everything else. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces. I have 56 odd slides in only half an hour. Um, many of you who, who I do know, uh, know that I'm the president co-founder of Strange Loop. We're in the business of automating uh, performance. Uh, making it faster. What some of you don't know is that my previous career was uh, in development economics, working in the microfinance industry. Uh, microfinance, for those who don't know, is giving out small loans, often to uh, women, often in rural areas, and I was stationed in West Africa doing that work. And uh, I had 80,000 women that we were trying to turn into entrepreneurs, and as an entrepreneur myself now, I realize that that's a pretty tricky thing to do. One of the things, and I didn't listen to too much of what my professors told me, but one of the things I did listen uh, two was the fact that in development we make the same mistakes over and over again. We go to countries, we try to teach them things that work in our country, and often the teachers are people who have never done it themselves. So I was in the World Bank teaching women to be entrepreneurs, and I had never entrepreneured. No one in uh, the World Bank office had ever entrepreneured, and I decided in the 1990s that I was going to come home and learn to entrepreneur myself, and I happened to find myself in the middle of a revolution. And that revolution was the revolution of the internet. It was an incredibly exciting time. A lot of money was made and lost. And people came and said, you are so, you know, subsequently, people come to me and say, you're so lucky to have been in the internet. You were in a, you know, a, 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 a shift change in how the world looked at, at uh, technology. And here you'll see there have been a few. Now, we are a lucky generation. Um, we get to see two of them. We're right in the middle of one right now. And when young entrepreneurs come to me, I say, we are right in the middle of a revolution, of an evolution, of a huge change, and that's that we're in the middle of mobile. Now, mobile isn't good enough. I was talking to one of my friends in the VC community uh, last week, and he said, you know, it's, it's funny because the greatest minds of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click on banner ads. And the reality is, if you have a dumb phone, if you've got an old phone, you don't have a browser, and you can't click on ads, and you can't make the smartest people of our generation money. So what we really need is we need a mobile revolution, but we also need smartphones. And so what I want to do is, and we'll introduce this type of graph, we'll take a look at this in a few occasions, I want to look at smartphone adoption versus dumb phones over the last four years. And, and I'll take an example of Western Europe and Asia, and I want you to pay attention to two things. One is when we hit the tipping point, when more than 50% of phones sold in Western Europe, and use that as a proxy for any developing, developed country, became smartphones, Blackberries, iPhones, Androids, and how that relates to other parts of the world like Asia, where um, that penetration has not been as significant. Let's take a look. This is the baseline. This is where 2008 starts. Now, a few things to notice here. One is we've hit the tipping point in the Western world where most of us, obviously everyone in this room, I'm assuming, but most of the world actually owns a phone and a phone that can browse. And that's really important. As I start talking about the KPIs that affect people's business, we need phones that can browse. We need to be able to click on things. We need to be able to buy. But this has not affected the whole world. I was very surprised when I saw this graph and took a look at Asia and said, well, that's surprising to me. Um, I spend a lot of time in Asia, I spend a lot of time with people with mobile phones I don't, and smartphones. 
so if we have this revolution and we need smartphones, there's also been a dramatic change in who owns that phone, the actual underlying operating system. So if you take a look at this, you'll see a huge change over the last six years. What you're going to see is the sudden and dramatic rise of iOS and Android. You're going to see a crushing defeat to Symbian and, and Linux-based operating systems again. This is the evolution of smartphones taking over from the dumb phones. You'll see BlackBerry growing. I'm not sure how this is going to look in four years for them. And you'll see Windows with a very similar percentage of the market. So as we're carrying through here and, we're going to and we talk about case studies, it's important to understand who owns the underlying platform, who runs these devices, how this market uh, works. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the question that always comes up if we start talking about, okay, I get it, people own these phones. Do they go to sites? And this is where this data today, the state of data starts getting really weak. So let's take a look at three brands. Three brands that I applaud for actually publishing these numbers. Let's take a look at the percentage of mobile traffic that they get over the last four years. Now, I spend a lot of my time trying to sell that mobile is important. I use stats like this, and this is where all the buts come in. But it's an app. But it's a social network. But it's Twitter. Pandora, for those who don't know, is a movie sharing site. So these stats start getting us insight that some people are using their phones. Um, and are they buying? Well, they're certainly looking at sites. Let's take a look at the question of whether they're buying. I still can't convince my buyers that, that mobile is important enough in their business with stats like this. Let's start looking at the question of whether people spend money. Again, let's take a look at four brands and their evolution over the last three years. How much money they're making. So nice growth, nice doubling year in, year out. But ultimately, I get the same buts. But it's Amazon, but it's eBay, that's not me, and that's why we need to look at real-world case studies. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at two in-depth case studies and take a look at, are people buying? And most importantly, what's the effect on perf of performance on the key business metrics for that business? So first, a bit about data. So one of the things that we're, we're in this age of, of, of big data, and it's an age that I am uh, very excited about. We are able to correlate between what users do. We're able to look at how you know, their, their performance metrics. We've heard people this morning talking about real end user metrics. Obviously, that's important, and we're capturing those, that data in all of the statistics that we're looking at. We're also capturing what somebody's latency and bandwidth is. We're correlating that to all the business metrics. So in order to get this information, we need to combine a whole bunch of what today is siloed, but hopefully tomorrow won't be, which is real end user monitoring plus the business metrics and who buys, how much they buy, along with things like latency and bandwidth. So if you assume we have all of that together, let me introduce you to our first customer. Now, one of the things about the introduction of customers is that when I start sharing intimate details about retailers, they don't like me mentioning their name. Now, I'm going to try to give you as much of a picture of this retailer as I can, but I can't tell you who they are. This is a retailer that does over $3 billion a year in revenue. They have 30,000 employees. They've got stores, bricks and mortar stores, as well uh, in the US, as well as an online presence that serves both the US and Canada and Western Europe. And let me give you a feel for this customer in terms of who that shopper is. This site has 22,000 products on it. The average shopper is spending $100, and they are predominantly a woman in their 40s who makes a lot of money. This is a very good niche market. If you were in the marketing world, you'd say, this is fantastic. These are people I want to target. They have three, and one of the reasons I picked them for this case study is they have three avenues which mobile browsers can interact with. They've got a mobile site, they've got the full site, and they have an app. And that's what made this case particularly interesting to me. I get a lot of questions about the interaction between these three platforms. Let's take a look at how many page views come through each of these, and a few things to note. They launched the mobile site in January and the app in May. These are just mobile visitors. You can see that the full site takes the brunt of the mobile load. Although they have an M dot site which captures some traffic, we'll see that a lot of that traffic gets funneled off to the full site. And because a lot of their search, a lot of their, a lot of their 
traffic comes from search, particularly on mobile devices, those unique product searches often go to the full site as well. And I'm definitely seeing a trend in our industry moving towards full site functionality that might degrade for the device, but not individual siloed sites with different code bases. Now, let's take a look at the important question. Should this customer care? For every $100 spent, how much is spent on one of these devices? Because ultimately, that's what drives innovation and investment. So in 2010, in September 2010, 50 cents was spent on a mobile device. This was not getting a lot of attention. And I, you know, I was on with the media yesterday and I was getting some questions about mobile and is this the year? Is this the year? I get that question all the time. Well, the reality is we're seeing dramatic growth. One year later, this company was making $7 out of every 100 through a mobile device. That doesn't talk about how many people are searching in store for a product or price comparing at a competitor and choosing not to buy. It doesn't give us any of those statistics. These are just the raw numbers that drive this business. And what's so interesting is to look where those come from. About 50 cents comes from the app, about a dollar comes from the mobile site. And all of the rest comes from purchases on the full site. Again, this evolution that we're seeing mobile is important, it's growing 14 times for this customer over the last year. And the vast majority of that growth is coming on the full site. Trends that I'm seeing across many customers. Now let's return to this question of the mobile site. And this is a trend that I'm also seeing. For every 100 visitors who come just to the mobile site, I see that 35 of them, I'm sort of delayed on the clicker here, uh, 35 of them go to the full site because there's a full, view full site link. So people who are coming specifically get, sent, get redirected to the mobile site, a lot of them want to go see the full site. And we see a whole bunch of people that bounce on both the first view as well as, I don't know if I'm pointing this in the right direction, first view as well as the second view and a number of people that buy. One person that buys for every 100 people that come and buys on the mobile site. So I want to take a look, I'm just going to go back a slide here. I want to take a look at um, this market, this graph that we saw in the context of the customer. So if this is what the market looks like, what does this customer's page views look like across these different browsers? So what I want to do is I want to take all these operating systems and I can't actually look at all of them. So I'm going to take out other and I'm going to take out Linux. I'm going to also unfortunately have to take out Windows because there just isn't enough traffic. I'm going to divide iOS into two categories because I want to talk about the iPad and the iPhone separately. And I want to look at this page views by mobile browser over the last two and a half years, two years in essence. So up top on the right, you're going to see the total page views for the entire site that get through, that are come through a mobile device. And then we're going to see the page growth in page views across all of these browsers. In your mind, think about the seminal moments over the last year and a half or two years in the evolution of mobile. So we're sort of starting at a point where Jobs and the Google Boys haven't got along and Android's coming. I'm in a 3GS environment for the iPhone. The iPad really isn't out. Think about those seminal moments and watch how this customer's site interacts with those seminal moments. These are page views for mobile on these specific devices. Let's take a look. Hopefully. This is an iPhone world to start with. Here comes Android and the first version of the iPad comes out. I'm now almost doubled my page views. I'm almost six months into it. Big marketing campaign. The iPhone and the Android are together. The mother that we were talking about just got an iPad for Christmas and has just learned to use it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it is absolutely remarkable what happens to the iPad's evolution here. Now they're getting training from their teenage son or daughter and they're really using the iPad and it absolutely starts to dominate. I'm four times, about three times higher than I originally was in terms of page views. And I end this, not coincidentally, with eight and a half percent of this customer's mobile traffic coming over mobile devices, or traffic coming over mobile devices, this is starting to be substantial. And most importantly, it's really interesting to see the, the tight race between the iPhone and the Android. I was very happy to see this, because I hate pulling one out of the other. If I have to talk about Android versus iPhone, I get yelled at continuously, as does anyone that blogs about that. And the absolute dominance of the iPad. 
So I've sort of tried to set the stage. Now let's look at some of the key business metrics that affect this customer. Before that, I want to talk about one thing, which is when I looked at this data, and let me just go back, I see BlackBerry and Symbian, I shake my head and think, there's something wrong here. How can BlackBerry and Symbian be such a large part of the market share and not representative at all in this study? And so what we did is we've seen other studies, Cotendo did one, where they looked at this JavaScript-based analysis and the fact that some older Symbian browsers and many Blackberries don't support JavaScript, and I asked myself the question, are we dramatically under-reporting the quantity of traffic from these browsers? And so we looked at one analysis where we looked at the JavaScript information. We looked at another analysis where we did a log analysis of this site for a specific month. And you can see we are dramatically under-reporting Symbian and Blackberry users in that analysis. Now, to be fair, the fact that combined they're 3%, I'm pretty comfortable with the general conclusions here. But one of the things to note, as we saw, is that there is this discrepancy and it's something to keep, you know, to pay some attention to. So let's talk about HTML delay experiments. This is the greatest, I, 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 you know, when Google and Bing did this, I was very, very excited. Um, it's a way to really look at the direct impact of delay. And so what we did is we convinced this customer to do this. And people asked me how. And we did it because this customer is very interested in figuring out the value of time for their business. If they have more time, they can give a richer experience. So what we do is we delay the HTML. We're going to delay it by 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, and 1,000 milliseconds on a certain percentage of the users. And we're very lucky to have, I'm sure many of you listen to these talks from Google and Facebook, oh, we have this experimentation platform, and you're as jealous as I am. But we finally have got this ability for customers like this, where they can take small percentages of their traffic, delay them, speed them up, and figure out what the impact is. And the impact is dramatic. Let's take a look at the, you know, the statistically significant impact from these three delays over this 12-week experiment. Again, this is on mobile devices. So when I delay, a few things to note about this, and I, I had still do double takes when I look at these findings. The strong negative impacts across almost every, every number here, and also the, the really interesting linearity. This customer was blown away that they're going to lose 3.5% of their conversions if their site is delayed by one second on a mobile device. This was a very impactful um, stat for them and is helping to change their business and how they view mobile. Obviously, I'd encourage everyone to do these kind of experiments, but sometimes it's hard to convince your boss to do it. Every single metric was impacted. Now, I wasn't satisfied with this because I know that when I go to sites on a mobile device, occasionally, they'll take 15 seconds. And sometimes they'll take two. And no customer is going to let me slow their site down by 13 seconds to see really what happens. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to get to how I can try to sort of proxy that. But let's take a look before that at a statistic like bounce rate. So here I'm looking at the percentage change on something like bounce rate over the two main delays that we looked at, the 500 milliseconds and the one second. This is the change. So my, my baseline would be zero, and you can see as marketing does a better or a worse job, the bounce rate's going up depending on the clients that they're targeting and coming to the site. But you can see strong linearity here. Strong linearity. The trend maintains that 1, 000, a second is worse than 500 milliseconds, and they're going up and down. So this tells me at week one, I had a 10% change in bounce rate at, at one second delay. And then in week four, I had a two second difference in bounce rate. So you can see these going up and down. Again, strong linearity, strong negative effect. Now, we wanted to look beyond just the effect of delay um, in, in, the immediate, in the immediate time frame. So, you know, the question was more like, is this like a Band-Aid pull, being pulled off? Or is this like me telling my wife I don't want another kid? One has effect short term, and one creates years of pain. It really depends. And so we wanted to really figure out which was this. So we looked at a stat that was really important to this customer, which was, what is the percentage chance of a user coming back? And we looked at that during the experiment period and after the experiment period. And what we saw was that there was a long-term effect. If I slowed you down, you had a smaller chance of coming back. And if you don't come back, you don't buy. So we saw not only in the experiment period, but even beyond that, strong long-term effects from delay. Now, as I said, I wasn't particularly happy about the fact that I, no one lets me slow down their site by more than a second. So we 
and, and I say we, the, the team at Strange Loop decided to think of a few innovative ways to try to proxy. I can't do A-B tests here, but can I do something? And I, this, this is going to take a second to grok. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a look at the iPad, the Android phones, um, and the iPhone, and I'm going to look at bounce rate and performance. But instead of looking at time, which we've looked at in all of the other graphs, I'm going to look at network quality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a vast data set, and I'm going to divide it into cohorts based on your network quality. What is your, you know, in this case, the first cohort that we're going to look at is a, a people coming in that, that measure 250 kilobytes per second. Now, this is a range. It's sort of 200 to 300 kilobytes per second, so a slow connection. And obviously, there's an inherent latency window that will, that will move as well. And what you're going to see is you're going to see as the speed goes up, as I go from a really crappy modem to a really fast connection, what happens to bounce rate and the average performance across those groups? This is a way to try to, try to simulate trend lines across a larger, a larger gap of, of, of change in terms of performance. So I'm going to press play, and what you'll notice is these dots are going to start moving down to the left because bounce rate's going to come down as performance goes up because performance impacts the key metrics. Let's take a look. As many of you know, I'm really into this kind of analysis where I, take, where I take different metrics. It's really interesting to see these lines, and we'll sort of add trend lines here to make them a little easier to see. So I have, at any point in time, I've got, an, I've got a bounce rate for that particular user group over a network quality, and I also have performance. And it's really interesting to see the slope of these lines. This tells me that performance matters across the entire spectrum, and it also tells me that, for example, the iPad users up here are of much less patience at high speed, at low speeds. When, when things are really slow, iPad users go away much faster than Android and iPhone users, for example. But you can see as the time gets faster, iPad users tend to stay, and the bounce rates dramatically go lower. So this is an interesting evolution and, 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 and an interesting way to take a look at stats to really show to this customer, hey, it's not just about you know, 500 millisecond increments or 1,000 or one second increments. When I look across the entire scope of performance, I can see bounce rates going from 24% all the way down to, for example, 5% as network quality gets better. And this is a really, and you can look at many metrics this way, and I really like looking at network quality to give me a bit of a broader picture. I want to um, move on to the second company, and this is one that's not an e-commerce company. This is an enterprise, more like an enterprise application. Here's an organization that uh, is quite large. They're a task-based organization. So you go from step one to step two to step three to step four to step five. Harder, obviously, to measure the KPIs. This is a voluntary application. So you could do this task by calling a sales rep or a customer service rep. You could also do this task in the traditional form in faxing. At, to this business, when you call a rep, it's expensive. When you fax, it's expensive. The internet is by far the least expensive way for this customer to do their business. So they launched an app, launched a site, in order to accomplish that. And this is really exciting. This is a very large organization, sort of Fortune 500. Um, and this was one specific app. It targets Europe, the United States, and Asia. And it was launched when we started the study. So it's pretty cool to be there early. So the first thing I want to show you is their uh, page views. And their page views are um, obviously in week one, we can see, you know, and it's interesting to see word of mouth. Somebody said the iPad worked on this app. And then they start telling their friends. And very, very quickly, the iPad absolutely dominates the transactions here. So you can see that this is the type of site that, you know, phones work, but it's probably a little difficult to use. But certainly the iPad is really, really works really, really well. And we asked ourselves, what kind of experiment could we, take, could we do on a site that's task-based, that has step one, then step two, then step three, step four? And it reminds me of a conversation I had with Steve. I was playing hooky one day, and I was on the phone with Steve, and, and uh, I, was, I was in the lineup for Alcatraz. I don't know if anyone's been to Alcatraz. It's a, it's a prison in San Francisco. And I was talking to Steve, and we were talking about this idea of what happens when you slow down a page in a flow. You know, is it about the first page? Is it about how f slow the fastest page is? What is it that really determines the key metrics for a business? So we, I took that inspiration, and we decided to do a 
analysis of a flow. And this is pretty cool. So what you're going to see on the left is a representative user or a cohort of users. And I'm going to walk you through the five-step process. And I'm going to start with a baseline where every page is fast. Every page is sub five seconds. So we take a vast amount of data, we find all of the users where every page is sub five seconds, and we plot them here in terms of their groups. So let's take a look. These users are going to flow across this diagram. They're going to turn red when they've bounced and they've just given up on the task. And they've chose to either not do it, or they choose to do it through the telephone, or fax, really expensive ways for this company to get their job done. And at the end, we'll see how many make it through. So let's take a look. So four of these cohort bounced on the first step. So I wind up with five of this representative user base that finishes the task successfully. One out of every three. Which this organization would like to get better, but this is, a, this is a good start. That saved them. They can quantify how much money that saved them. It saved productivity time for their other employees. This has a business value for this customer in the same way that conversion had business value for the e-commerce e customer we talked about. So now let's look at what happens when I slow down step one. So this is about slowing down one of the steps in the process. Instead of a four second page, let's add two seconds of latency. Again, before the HTML is shipped, so we receive a request, we stop, we pause, and then we ship it out. Let's take a look at what happens at the end of the day when I slow down the first step for this organization. Again, by two seconds here. In theory, it will start to move. Here we go. My bounce rate almost doubles. I lose almost twice as many users on that first page. So this is how an organization can quantify performance. We're not, you know, it's very exciting and sexy to talk about conversion and bounce rate and metrics like this, but this gives us a real idea for what happens, what does two seconds of latency do, or, you know, added time do to mobile devices on a task-based application? And this is dramatic. I've lost more than 50% of the users who would finish a task. This is a huge loss for an organization. So I didn't end the study there because I actually was interested in you know, the conversation I had with Steve reminding me, I don't want to slow down the first page. We should all know at this point that slow performance for our landing pages makes a huge difference. What happens when I slow down a page in the middle of the flow? So I'm going to slow down step three now by two seconds. Let's take a look at the outcome for this company. I, again, almost double the bounce rate on that step. And so it's bad to slow down your bounce rate, your first page, but it's equally bad to have a slow page in the middle of your flow. Although it's not as detrimental, obviously you can see from the results, it really is terrible for the organization. And imagine if each of these users was worth $200 to this organization, they can easily quantify the business pain of performance. I want to end with a few observations. As I said, I'm seeing a dramatic change to people wanting full site functionality, and I'm seeing apps being very specific only for certain groups. What you can see from this results, and, and again, I'd recommend everyone share their own results if they're able, that speed matters, mobile matters, it's not the be-all and end-all. We're not seeing 50% of site traffic on the customers we looked at come over mobile, but the growth is phenomenal. And I think when I come back here in a year, we'll see a big, big dramatic difference. And I want to end with one thing. I want people to measure their mobile performance. And I want you to measure it because if you don't monitor it, sort of Theo came to this point, if you don't monitor it and you don't measure it, you'll never change it. What we've seen in our world is when we measure things, we see change. And I don't see enough organizations measuring their mobile performance. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.